Okay. Good morning. I, my name is Kathy Kokus. I'm with Kitsap Economic Development Alliance, and I coordinate the Procurement Technical Assistance Center for Washington State in Kitsap County. Our service area is Kitsap, North Mason, Gig Harbor, Kitsap County, Jefferson County, Clallam County. But in the age of Zoom and online meetings, you know, you can kind of go wherever you like for PTAC assistance. Um, I'm going to have Terry introduce himself last as he'll be leading you through today's session on finding opportunities. I'll just interrupt him when I feel like it because that's how I do things. Uh, <laughs> he's used to it. But before we get started, um, let's just take a moment to do some quick intros. And since Maurice, we kind of know you, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, my name is Maurice Johnson. Um, I have a small business firm that exclusively sells to uh, the Department of Defense and I'm currently in Florida and I'm moving to Washington State soon and I'm really excited about that and um, I'm just really happy to be here. Super welcome. Okay, is that Raven? Hi there, good morning. I'm good morning. Raven White Wolf and I am uh, opened my own consulting firm in January, White Wolf Engineering Services. Um, recently been approved for um, the Minority Women in Business certification as well as having a uh, pre-qualification agreement with WashDOT. So looking forward to finding out how to capitalize on some of that and find some work. Super. So that's the state MBE and WBE certification. And I got the federal as well. Yep. Oh, okay. It's federal only for transportation and FAA. If you want woman owned small business for other federal agencies, that's a separate certification. Okay. Maybe we can chat on that one. I yeah. might already have that started with. Um, uh, now I can't even think of the name of the, oh, I'm sam.gov, that whole process. Um, I don't know, maybe that's what you're talking about. Hoping. Um, it's actually through the SBA, but yeah, we'd be happy yes. to, to talk about that. So next I see Jennifer. Good morning, guys. Good morning. All right, I'm Jennifer and I'm with Evans Engineering. We are a engineering and consulting firm. And let's see, we have our AA and our DBEs in three states. So just looking to see how we can maximize the limited time we have in the AA program. Okay. And Raven, that's something you would probably qualify for as well, 8A for federal. Uh, Brittany. Good morning, everybody. My apologies. I'm having a little issue with my camera this morning. Um, but hello, happy to be here. I am an executive assistant with Aero Precision USA. We are located in Tacoma, Washington currently. Um, we are working on a move to Lakewood, Washington, hoping to be there around the beginning of the new year. Um, we are manufactured, specialize in AR-15s, AR-10s, and small arms parts. Um, so a big goal of mine this year is to get, um, I'm hoping one to two federal contracts. So I'm really just immersing myself in the system. Um, we've been in business for 20 years now and um, kind of our first time going after federal contracts at the moment. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. Okay, so you will need to become intimately familiar with a term called ITAR. ITAR, I'm gonna write that down. Correct, Terry? ITAR, arms, guns, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That is how you keep yourself out of trouble, Brittany, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kathy, that's a, that's a big thing. I try to stay out of trouble, so thanks for the information there. I'm gonna look into that further, I appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, I'm gonna turn um, the screen on. Terry's gonna introduce himself. Hi, I'm Terry Hombert. I'm a retired Department of Defense contracting officer. I retired December of 2018, and the day afterwards, I uh, started volunteering with PTAC. Um, so many of my colleagues 
uh, have retired and gone fishing. Didn't want anything to do with procurement. And I decided with uh, 29 years of experience of pre-award and post-award, working half of my career overseas and the other half here in the States, uh, that I just didn't want to throw it away. I thought it was too valuable. Uh, there were things I couldn't tell you as a contracting officer. And now I'm on the other side of the table working with you um, to help you compete to get federal contracts awarded to you. Uh, so I'm really enjoying this. Lots of clients with varying degrees of experience, um, helping them in all phases. And there's a class that I teach that's uh, pre-award. It's all the steps required up through and including the award of a federal contract and a couple of steps beyond that too that are important. So, um, so I'm here for you. You got questions? Hopefully I can answer them for you. Uh, so most of my experience was with uh, service contracts, construction contracts, and architect engineering contracts. And I held uh, most of the positions with the government-wide purchase card program also. And we will be talking about that here. All right, so next slide. Are you ready? So uh, I think, I'm going to assume that some most of you are already registered in SAM, but SAM is the place where you have to be registered in order to receive a federal contract. Also, you have to keep your SAM registration current because when you submit an invoice, you have to have a current SAM registration also. So two important things. One, you got to be in SAM to get an award. And two, you got to be in SAM to get paid. And we don't do work for free, right? <laughs> We're all here to make money. So you got to have your SAM registration current. Uh, DSBS is the, is the Dynamic Small Business Search uh, website. That's through the Small Business Administration. When you register in SAM, you, there will be an opportunity for you to create your profile. That's keywords about your business that is supposed to go into DSBS. But you, after you're done with your registration and your cage code comes to you in four to six business days, you want to go into DSBS, the SBA website, Small Business Administration, and check your profile. It's very important that you have a profile in there because the federal agency contracting officers, like I used to be, that is a one of the sources for the federal um, agencies to do market research. So not only do you do market research, but the federal uh, agency contracting officers must do market research too to find small businesses that can fulfill their requirement. Uh, accurate certification. So in, so in SAM, there's a screen where you identify your certifications. Small business, that's self-certification. The rest of them, you need to get a uh, certificate, a certification, whether it's a woman-owned small business, a uh, veteran-owned uh, veteran or a service-disabled veteran-owned small business, uh, whether you're a hub zone small business, um, and the SBA 8A program. So those are all certifications. Uh, the veteran-owned small business comes from va.gov. The Veterans Administration is still issuing that. It's gonna be moving over to the SBA, but it hasn't done that yet. The rest of them, you go through the Small Business Administration website at uh, certified.sba.gov. <clears throat> so you wanna make sure that your certifications are accurate. Uh, your SAM registration is probably gonna always be evolving and changing as you get your certifications from the SBA. You wanna go back into SAM, go to the screen with your uh, that shows your certifications and mark the boxes. Uh, part of that also, when you register, is uh, your NAICS codes. You need to know your NAICS codes. You can have more than one NAICS code. But part of that process is once you determine your NAICS code, which is a six-digit number, then you go to the SBA website for size standards and you determine whether you are a small business or a large business because you need that when you go into SAM and you put your NAICS code in. You got to identify whether you're a small or large business. Marketing materials and elevator speeches. So marketing materials, would, an example would be your capability statement. 
working with the federal government, they will ask you for your capability statement. If you don't have one, ask uh, Kathy to send you the template and the guide. And when you get your first draft, you can send it to us. And we'll uh, review it and meet with you and discuss our comments and move on to the second draft and the third draft. And so it's not uncommon that we go through two, three, four drafts before we get a capability statement good enough to give out to the federal agencies. And um, Terry, we'll just remind them too that um, you'll probably want more than one capability statement, one for federal, one for state. And if you have different um, service or product lines, you may want some targeted for those as well. Right. So part of that uh, process for determining how many capability statements you need or want is uh, who do you want to target uh, your business to? To the state of Washington, to the federal agencies, private industry, to the city, school district, or whatnot. So that will help you decide how many capability statements that you'll need. Your elevator speech, uh, for those who don't know what that is, the example is you get into the elevator on the ground floor of a multi-story building and you happen to notice the person standing next to you in the elevator is uh, somebody of interest that you might be able to sell your product to. So you've got about 90 seconds before the door opens again. So that's your, that's your 90 second elevator speech, telling them who you are, what your business is, what you have to offer, your certifications, your small business, whatnot. Yeah, so that's your elevator speech. So we practice those, we develop those uh, for you too. Uh, and then who buys what you sell? That's your market research. And we'll talk more about that here shortly. Anything else you want to add, Kathy? Uh, nope, I think you did that. I would say, you know, who buys what you sell is super important. There's nothing worse than spending your time and someone else's time and they're not interested in what you have to offer. Yeah, you go to the, uh, the shows, the outreach programs, and you walk up to, say, the United States Navy small business representative, and you ask them, what do you buy? That's not market research. You should have done your research before you went to meet with them and decided whether they do buy something from you or if they don't, then why are you in line talking to them? Go, go to the agencies that do buy your product or service. <clears throat> Finding your potential buyers. So the big one uh, is beta.sam.gov. We've provided the website there for you. On May 24th, uh, that website is going to change to just sam.gov. It's what it used to be. So for the past... Uh, year and a half, GSA has been moving in all kinds of websites into one location and said you have to go to multiple locations on the internet. And they, so the trial period and bring it all in, it was called beta.sam.gov. On May 24th, they're pretty much done and they're gonna go back to the old website called sam.gov. Yeah, I'm sure it'll just be super smooth, aren't you, Terry? Right. So right now we're in a one month transition because uh, was it a week ago? I think it was May 3rd. They uh, changed the display on the website, beta.sam.gov. And so instead of changing the display and changing the name, they have one month of just the new display, and then they're going to change the name a month later on May 24th. Oh, so it must have been April 24th to change it because that's one month. <laughs> <clears throat> so in beta.sam, that's where you click on uh, contract opportunities and you can slice and dice the uh, solicitations any way you want. You can put in your NACE code, keywords, the federal agency that you're interested in, any number of ways, uh, set aside for small business or a woman-owned small business and up pops as you are putting in that search criteria, the solicitations are popping up. And then you can look at, you can see what federal agency uh, issued that solicitation. Uh, 
You can open up the solicitation to get more information. You can see when it was issued, when the proposal's due, is all right there on that first screen. So that's a, that's a great place. USA Spending, uh, and there's a website there for that one also, identifies all the federal agencies and how much they have spent. And, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kathy, also, they show it by socioeconomic programs. Yeah, uh, you, you can search multiple ways. I find USA Spending easier to manipulate than the um, FPDS that's on BetaSAM. Um, so USA Spending is a great place or the FPDS to find awards. And so you can search by NAICS. You can search if you know who your competitors are and if you know they are doing government contracting you can search by company on usa spending and see what awards they've received and who they're selling to if you have an idea of who may purchase what you sell you can search by that agency usa spending if you run reports often includes subcontract awards which is great because then you could, because some of the stuff you offer may be more conducive to working as a subcontractor. So, who are those big companies that are going to purchase what you have? So, it's good to know who's getting those big contracts. And you can also put your name on any solicitations on um, SAM, Beta SAM when Terry was talking about finding different solicitations. So you don't, you can't do the whole thing, but you'll see that there's a component you could do. You can add your name as an interested vendor once you are signed in to SAM. Yeah, so beta.sam.gov is to find current solicitations, USA spending, oh, you do your market research to find out what contracts have been awarded in the past. It's not, the, it's not a site to find current or future solicitations. GSA e-library, uh, Kathy, help me out on that one. I'm not familiar. Well, a lot of people think GSA is a way to go. So this, and GSA's website is enormous. And Mary Jo is our team member out today, but she is kind of our GSA guru. So if you think that's a place you want to sell to and be on their catalog and offer things, then um, you would request to meet with Mary Jo. Yeah, so the GSA schedules, um, General Services Administration recently decided to take their multiple contracts and merge them into one to three contracts. So all those previous contractors and contracts, they aren't disappearing, they just merged them in. So you go into one schedule and you find all kinds of products and services as opposed to going to different uh, individual contracts for a particular product or a particular service. So they're, make, they're under a way of doing a big change. Also, they have a lot of criteria if you want to be on a GSA contract that you need to meet, and you know, something like ten thousand dollars a year, you got to sell. Otherwise, you're off the contract. Um, it, there's a lot of uh, requirements for that, so that's something that you want to check into. I have a question, if you don't mind. Sorry, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm currently. Um, on a GSA schedule with a, I'm using a GSA schedule from a distributor that I work with. Um, so he, really, so they're, they're on schedule and you're- they are, They're on schedule and I'm authorized to to quote on their schedule. Um, you mean the, buy, buy from them and then resell it? Correct, yes. I can, okay. I can sell, I can sell uh, their, I can sell at their, pri at their GSA price level uh, using their GSA uh, schedule number. Haven't done anything with it yet because I don't know quite how I should um, angle that, uh, how to put that into a marketing piece or or how does any of that work? So I've just kind of been sitting on it, haven't done anything with it. I was wondering if you could 
just shed some light or some, you know, what should I do? Or is there any, I mean, I, I don't really know how it works. Well, my first thought is, do you have a capability statement? Yes. Okay. So you, on your capability statement, you're identifying the kinds of products that are available from you to a federal agency, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I am. Um, the, I think the, the bigger problem is is on that GSA schedule. If you're buying anything and everything and reselling it, well, then you're not going to list all that in your capability statement. That's exactly. Just uh, overdoing it. Exactly. You need to categorize if you're going to specialize in like not pharmaceuticals, but uh, medical supplies or uh, something for the Navy for the ships or something for the Air Force for their base or uh, FEMA for uh, emergency services or the forestry. You've got a plane that can put out fires. You know, you can identify those categories instead of every nut and bolt that you sell from a particular industry. This happens to deal with more uh, of the like electronics, uh, computer software, computers, things of that nature. Um, hundreds and hundreds of products, yeah. So categories to put on your capability statement. Okay, would I put that? Would I put that company's GSA schedule on the on that or? I don't know I, what I, I, I think you would have to identify that you are a verified vendor for that. Um, oh, a distributor for the manufacturer? Yeah, for that, that GSA vendor. Because, you know, the thing that GSA is, is that's a guaranteed price and everybody knows what the price is because they can see the catalog. But is it a proprietary product or can you no. get it elsewhere? No, it's um, it's it's not a proprietary product. It's it's this company has um, tons and tons of everything um, to do with software, electronics, uh, anything you can think of in that realm, walkie-talkie, anything that you can think of. They um, they're a huge uh, distributor. For, they're a distributor for all, a lot of these Fortune 500 companies, like. Uh, so they house all of their products and all their products are on a GSA schedule. Okay. Um, yeah. I think... their company, which they're allowing me to okay. say, Hey, yeah, you can use, you, you can use our schedule number. You can, you can put your logo on our GSA schedule and you can send it out. Um, okay. I just really don't know how that works on the other end, but I know what they're telling me, but as uh, former contracting officers, you know, just was, yeah. How, yeah. Yeah. We'll work, we'll work with that out. Um, but, okay. um, but you also want to make sure that that is still the best price. Don't just assume that they're on schedule and they're offering the best price. Okay. So you're buying it from this uh, GSA contractor at the listed price, and then you're reselling it for a higher price to mark it up? No, they have, uh, they have, they have your, they have my price. And then they have the GSA price that it should be sold at. So you can sell it for less than the distributor's price? No, 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 no. I, I can sell it. I can sell it at their distributor price, but I'm still making a profit margin on it because I'm buying it obviously less than. You're buying it wholesale and selling it for retail. Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. So moving on, we're on to DLA. DLA is Defense Logistics Agency. It's, a, it's an agency within the Department of Defense. There's their website. Uh, they have their solicitations on that website and you can find past contract awards on that site also. Last is third party. Uh, in parentheses, there is subscription, meaning you gotta pay for that service. Uh, so FedMine is a great source. It's also pricey. Um, but you can slice and dice all that data in there any way you want and as far back as you want. Uh, just keep in mind there's a 90 day delay from when an agency awards a contract to when it shows up in these uh, databases. Can I ask a question on that real quick, uh, Terry? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, with FedMine or GovSpend, 
Say for a lot, a lot of times the military will sell the same, will buy the same thing over and over again. So say for example, if the military wanted uh, some type of um, some type of transformer, and um, I see a new bid out there for a transformer. When you say uh, bid, you mean solicitation? Yes, sir. Solicitation for that. If I go, if I subscribe to one of these FedMine or GovSpend. Will I be able to go in there and see uh, what this brand sold for even three years ago up, up until is recent? Will, will I be able to have that access? Yeah, you pay for the service. You yeah. can, you, you, that, there's probably also uh, one of the fields is a range, dates, from and to. And you probably make that as big as you want or as narrow as you want. Last year, last three years, last 10 years. Yeah, and Washington PTAC does have a subscription to GovSpend. I think we still have FedMine. FedMine, yeah. Um, you know, and we do have limited capacity to do some research. We can't be researching all day, every day, but um, we do have some capacity um, to do some of that research. Yeah, I just used it uh, about a month ago. And then because we had a speaker from FedMine uh, did a workshop for us talking about their services. So we learned about it. And then afterwards I went in and, and asked FedMine, well, how much is a subscription? <laughs> I was blown away. But I found out that PTAC uh, has a subscription. So I went to PTAC and they did the search for me and I got the information for my client. So we could go through you guys and say, hey, can you give me some historical data on this transformer? Who purchased this in the last three years and for how much? Yep. Okay, so I would just get with you on that, Kathy? Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, I think we're ready for the next page. How does the federal government buy? So across there is contracting departments, contracting agencies, and contracting vehicles. So there are, I believe it's still 15 uh, departments of the federal government, uh, like Department of Defense is one, Department of Commerce is part of Department of Homeland Security now. So, you know, Congress uh, a number of years ago created uh, a department called Department of Homeland Security and they rolled up a lot of uh, standalone agencies before and put them all under the Department of Homeland Security. So you got the Coast Guard, uh, FEMA, Treasury, they're all under Department of Homeland Security now. But there are still uh, some 15 federal agencies. And within those agencies, there are agencies. So a good example is the Department of Defense. Within the Department of Defense, there's what was uh, DLA, uh, the Navy, the Air Force, the Army, and some other Department of Defense agencies also. Defense Health Services is another one. Uh, contracting agencies external, we talked about GSA. Uh, I'm at a loss for some other examples on uh, GSA well, schedules. Because the so they're, they're the big fish, right? They're, they're the one. They're the biggest ones. So they are the agencies. So for all the other agencies that have a need for supplies, for example, they buy from GSA. GSA is the purchasing of the warehouse, the big box store for all the federal agencies. So they go out and do the contracts, the GSA schedules and, not, and whatnot uh, for what all the federal agencies need for the most part, there's lots of exceptions. Like they don't buy uh, jet fighters for the Air Force. The Department, the Department of Defense does that. So types of contract vehicles, and there are many types. Uh, you will probably hear the term MAC, that is Multiple Award Construction Contract. There are also MACs, M-A-C, Multiple Award Contracts. Uh, Seaport E is a vehicle within the Department of the Navy. Within the Navy is one of its uh, eight systems commands called Naval Sea Warfare. So they have a, so it's kind of like uh, GSA schedule. Seaport E is 
contracts that have um, been vetted by NAVC and have been awarded contracts that provide different types of services. Uh, my last four and a half years with the Navy, I issued task orders against the C4D contract for professional services. Um, I contracted for construction managers, engineering technicians, uh, financial assistance, and whatnot for a year or two at a time. So that's what NAVC has. And that's, if, if you can, if you, what you have to sell aligns with uh, C4D, that is a good mechanism uh, for you to get a contract because it gets good for a number of years. And they just, oh, I think it probably is already closed. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The follow on contract. So it won't be available now for probably another three, four years. For, yeah. So yeah. what you want to, if you think C port E or C port next gen um, is an opportunity for you, um, the words that you would want to look for in our PTAC materials is when we say rolling admission is open. That's what they call um, their registration and acceptance, rolling admission. Um, I don't know why it's special, um, but it, and, and there's no set schedule. It's just whenever they decide they need more vendors. Yeah, and they have a lot of them, a lot of contractors, and they are categorized by the NAICS codes. So. But you can be a subcontractor to current seaport um, folks. So then you would just need to do some research on who are the current seaport contract holders. Yeah, so before I forget, this is the second time this run through my mind uh, since we started this uh, class, is one of the things that we tell our clients, you, is, if you're just starting to get, you've been in business and in commercial industry and whatnot, working for the state or the county or uh, private industry, and now you want to expand and potentially compete for federal agency contract awards, it's probably better, and our advice to you, is to start out as a subcontractor, vice the prime contractor. Federal, federal contracting is a huge bureaucracy and there is so much to learn. There's so many nuances to it. So as a subcontractor, you'll get to learn some of it, probably not even half of it, but you'll get to learn how to put proposals together for modifications to a contract after award, uh, the invoicing process, the reporting requirements, the key personnel that you're gonna need because you have a federal contract. Uh, so you get, you get, exposure to some of the requirements. And then you make that decision after you've got a contract that went on for two or three years, you've got that many years of experience, or you've got a number of contracts in a short period of time. So you've got exposure and experience to uh, working with a number of uh, federal contracts as a subcontractor, and then you make the decision. And as I recently told one of my clients, there's three choices that you can make. One, you like, you're comfortable with what you're doing, so you're gonna stay as a subcontractor. Number two, uh, you're, you want more, you wanna be a prime contractor, you've got enough experience under your belt now, so you wanna step up and compete to be the prime contractor, the awardee of a federal contract. And number three, you are so fed up with the federal contract bureaucracy, I'm getting out, I don't even wanna be a subcontractor anymore. Those are the three choices. And I, I've experienced the companies choosing all three of those. All right, so back to contract vehicles. Uh, third bullet is JOC, that is job order contract. So that is very similar to the first one, multiple award construction contract. The big difference is max are for larger value task orders and for longer performance periods. Job order contracts is more of uh, emergency, minor construction, and they issue task orders and they're typically for a shorter period of time. Uh, the Army calls them MATOCs, the Air Force calls them SABERS, and the Navy calls them JOCs. They're all the same. 
just three different titles. Uh, others, so there's BOAs, basic ordering agreements. Uh, there's the JOC and the MAC are uh, examples of IDIQ contracts, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. So the agency issues a contract, they know they need, for example, construction, but they don't have uh, particular projects in mind, but they're gonna have multiple projects over say a five year period. So uh, it's indefinite quantity, they don't know how many. Indefinite delivery, they don't know when. So that's where you get indefinite uh, delivery, indefinite quantity, IDIQ. So what then, so, so they award the contracts, they're they potentially good for five years, one year at a time. And as that year comes and goes, the agency has a requirement to build a doghouse. So they got a statement of work, they issue it to those uh, contractors who won the basic IDIQ contract, just those four or five companies compete for it. And one of them gets the award to go build a doghouse. That's the example of IDIQ, that's how that works. Uh, there are a number of other types of uh, contracts also. Another one is purchase orders. So under the simplified acquisition procedures, uh, the simplified acquisition threshold currently is $250,000. So anything less than that, the agencies can do a simplified acquisition procedure and the result is uh, a purchase order. All right, I think I've exhausted that. Anything you want to add? Kathy? No, I'm good. Okay, next slide. How does the federal government buy? So uh, credit cards, so I was talking about earlier, the government-wide purchase card program. Uh, it's like a Visa or a MasterCard. The, all the federal agencies are using it and every year they use it more and more. So uh, credit card, there are limitations uh, and it depends on if the purchase card holder has a warrant or not, but typically you can go up to $25,000 with just the purchase card buy. So they'll could solicit uh, three, four companies. Uh, when I was a purchase card holder, um, this is going back 20 years, dating myself, uh, I, we were using the yellow pages then. <laughs> so I go into yellow pages, I find three companies, I give them a call. The first question I ask is, do you accept a bank card? The answer is no, thank you very much. <laughs> we move on to the next one. As soon as they say yes, then I tell them what I have, when I need it, uh, do they have the capacity and capability? And they say yes, then uh, they give me a price and I say, okay, go do it. And then when, the, when my agency, uh, does the inspection that it was completed and it's satisfactory, they, that technical person tells me that, me being the contracting officer, and then the company can call me and say, hey, I finished the job. And my technical person says, yep, they finished it. They did a great job. And I give them my credit card number over the phone. They're paid the next day. As opposed to having a formal contract in every, Federal agency has a different method of how you submit your invoice electronically. And typically though, for say you're submitting an invoice on a service contract, you submit a complete and accurate and acceptable invoice, you don't get paid for 30 days. So the credit card program, you know, money talks, getting paid the next day, I would certainly think would be more advantageous than getting paid in 30 days. But Contracts can be paid with a via purchase card also. So there's a lot of uh, federal agents that don't know that aspect of the government wide purchase card program. That if you have a service contract and it's millions of dollars per year, you're submitting an invoice once a month. So there's 12 invoices a year. And your invoice can uh, be paid up to $1 million per invoice via a credit card. And so then you're paid to the next day, not 30 days later. So that's credit cards. So that's important. Uh, and what we have on our capability statement is to have you put down whether you accept or accept the 
government-wide purchase card. So if you uh, accept credit cards for payment, uh, you want to put that on your capability statement because federal agencies would be interested in that. Micro purchase, there's a micro purchase threshold as, a, as well as a simplified acquisition uh, threshold. Micro purchases are up to $25,000 in the United States and $30,000 OCONUS, which, uh, which is outside continental United States. The simplified acquisition threshold is up to now $250,000. Both of those just went up this past uh, 12 months to these figures. So the federal acquisition regulation uh, directs contracting officers that if they have a requirement with a government estimate that is less than $250,000, they are to the greatest extent to try and set it aside to small businesses only, not full and open competition where large businesses can compete for it. And one of the ways that they do that is through market research. So they're going to sam.gov to find companies. They're going to the SBA website, dynamic small business search uh, engine to find small businesses. <clears throat> Another vehicle under market research is sources sought. And I can't stress this enough. This is very important for you to seek out those sources sought and respond to them. There are three times that an agency posts a notice in what's going to be beta.sam. or currently beta.sam.gov and going to be sam.gov under contract opportunities. There are three times that the agency will uh, potentially submit notices. The first one is the source of thought. That's when the agency is doing market research. They are wanting to know if there are small businesses out there that have the capacity and the capability of fulfilling this short statement that they're gonna put in the synopsis in their source of sought notice. And below that, they're, they're gonna tell you, please provide the answers to the following questions. And then there's gonna be a cutoff date. So typically a source of sought is out there for 10 to 14 days. Very important for you to respond, especially if you have a certification other than small business, say woman known or better known, or you're in your 8A company or you're a hub zone company to respond and I will even go one step further, know your competition and know their certifications. Because if you know others that have the same certification as you, say you are a service disabled, better known small business, you know who your competition is and those that are also service disabled, better known small business certified to contact them, email, phone or whatever and get them uh, bring it to their attention that the source of thought is out there and that they should respond to that also if they're interested. And the reason for that is, is if the contracting officer gets enough responses to that source of thought for your socioeconomic certification, that contracting officer can set aside that solicitation just to your small business certification in this case, service disabled, better known small business. Only companies that have that certification can compete for the award of the contract. That is why it is so important for companies to do not ignore source of thought. The next time that a notice comes out is a pre-solicitation notice. So what the agency is saying, on or about 45 days from now, we will be issuing this solicitation. So they're forewarning you so you can prepare to be looking for the third notice that comes out, which is the solicitation. And typically a solicitation is out there for 30 days. So once it hits, that proposal's due in 30 days. Exceptions. One exception would be if it's a design build construction project. Those are typically out there for 45 days because you got to do a concept drawing. So it takes time to do that and then to price it, to put a proposal. So they give you another two weeks for that. Uh, okay, so those are the notices uh, set aside for simplified acquisition procedures. Anything under $250,000, the agency is uh, supposed to try and set it aside for small businesses. 
I think we exhausted that slide. Anything you want to add, Kathy? Nope. You always cover everything. <laughs> I try. There's so much. There's so much. <laughs> uh, that's, and now it's easy for you and stuff. All right. Where are we at here? Where the opportunities are found. So what we have here is some of this is a repeat from the previous slides is where to find solicitations you know, and notices. So there again, the first one is uh, federal opportunities uh, on beta.sam.gov. I believe it's called contract opportunities. It used to be called FedBizOps. It had a standalone website. Now it's in beta.sam.gov, soon to be sam.gov. Uh, Fed Connect. So what we're doing here is providing you the websites to find um, solicitations. So there is, you know, there's GSA, there's the DLA dibs we talked about earlier, uh, cyber and STTR for research and development. If you're into that, doing research and development, you want to be aware of that website to find opportunities with any of the federal agencies for research and development. Oh, a big one at the very bottom is uh, Washington PTAC as a service. It is the only service that we charge for. It's called bid match. It is a, oh, how would I want to say? It is a time saver for you, especially as a small business, you don't have many employees. Bid match will scour over 131 websites looking for solicitations for you. It's a one page application. You put in your NAICS codes, keywords, the geographic area that you want to work in, some other questions. You submit that and for the first 30 days, it's a trial period, free. Um, see, see how you like it. And it works 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It, it reviews websites for federal agencies, state agencies, counties, cities, universities, school districts. And Kathy, am I correct in saying private industry also? Uh, sometimes. Okay. Um, ports. Any, any government entity that has a website that can be searched and if for whatever reason, some public agency is not on there, we can request that they be added to their search. Um, and how well it works is how, based on keywords and NAICS codes. Right. So as I was starting to say, this is a great time saver. So if you're a small business and it's just you and maybe somebody else or you got less than five people, to be able to go through, if you're willing to take work from any government agency, whether it's capital G or little g, is the time saver. For you or any employee to go through 131 websites on a weekly, if not daily basis, that is a huge uh, con consumption of your time. This is $165 per year, $65. $16 a month, it does it for you. There is no other service that charges this small of a fee. I can't overemphasize the importance of this. To have somebody else do this for you. MJ. Yeah, um, how does uh, bid match uh, compare to FedMine or GovSpin? FedMine and GovSpin are historical uh, okay. contracts that have been awarded in the past. Okay. And you and you pay a fee for those, but that's the past. You're looking for the future. You want to find solicitations, current, you know, or what's coming. Uh, so that's what bid match does for you. Is Thank find you. solicitations the day they come out that are advertised, and then you get an email, and you get the opportunity to look at it and say, "Yeah, that's got my name on it." I'm putting a proposal together and going to submit it. You get the solicitation. You click on it. You get the solicitation. Or you read it and say, no, I don't have the capability or I don't have the capacity. Or why did I get this? I need to go back into and tweak my application for bid match so I don't get this extreme, um, extraneous stuff. That's okay. Always. Terry, I, I apologize. I missed a question in the chat. 
uh, on the card holders. Is there a way to find purchase card holders who find my buy my NAICS codes? I'm going to say you need to work with a small business deputy for that command. Right. Um, so that's a good segue. Let's pause and talk about that. Con agency contracting officers do not have time to talk to you. you. You're not calling the contracting officers. Your advocate for each federal agency is the deputy for small business for that agency. That's who you want to get the name, contact information. They are the ones that are going to receive your capability statement. They are your advocate because every requirement that is over $25,000 that the contracting officer puts together and is planning on advertising and awarding contract has to go through the deputy small business for their approval. And if the deputy for small business likes the market research that that contracting officer did, and for example, the contracting officer did their market research, they put the notice in sam.gov, uh, sources sought, and they got back five women-owned small businesses, they are, stating, they, are, they are stating in that two-page report to the deputy for small business that I plan on setting this solicitation aside to a woman-owned small businesses. The deputy for small business reads that and says, yeah, I like this. They sign off approving it. They send it to the Small Business Administration. And in this area, it's in Seattle. They review it. They approve it send it back to the contracting officer for their file that the SBA has approved this uh, approach to fulfilling the requirement. Where was I going with that? <laughs> so get to the purchase card holders. Uh, right. Uh, so the, the deputy for small business, and each agency calls them something different. It could be the small business specialist, uh, deputy for small business, the director of small business, whatever. They all do the same thing. The federal acquisition regulation requires every agency to have a small business specialist. They are your advocate. So you're, you're going to try and get that point of contact for any agency or every agency that you want to do business with get your capability statement to them. There it's on file. Um, they are also going to know who the purchase card holders are. Uh, you're not going to be talking to the purchase card holder uh, to sell your goods and wares. You are contacting and in communication with the deputy for small business for that agency. So they know all the requirements over $25,000. They know who their purchase card holders are within and they will take your capability statements and they, they will pass them off to the contracting officers and to the purchase card holders. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've also had success where I've um, met, emailed my line card and capability statement out to uh, some buyers and they actually distributed it out to their colleagues. And I've had, I've had uh, call outs uh, based on that, doing that as well. Right. So that's why I was saying you give your capability statement to the deputy for small business and they will send them out to the contracting officers. Also, when the contracting officer submits a small business coordination report for a particular solicitation that they want to issue, uh, the small business and they say, OK, I did my market research and I can't find any small businesses, so I'm going to make this full and open. Well, the deputy for small business has a file of capability statements and they think of, or, and they may have an Excel spreadsheet or some database or something where they recorded your capability statements, your company, your email address, your website, your phone number, your names, all that kind of stuff. And they can say, oh, wait a minute. I've got a few companies, a few small businesses that can do that. So I am disapproving this solicitation plan and sending it back to the contracting officer and go do your market research. And oh, by the way, Here's three capability statements from small businesses that can do it. You know, start over again. Thank you. Okay. Any other thoughts before we move on here? So we were talking about bid bid match. <laughs> I, I'm a salesman here. I'm a big advocate for big for bid match. It will save you time. 
questions. If not, we'll move on. Oh, yes. Gary, horses sought. Uh, how does the strategy to start as a subcontractor intersect with the sources sought approach? And that's where you would put your name on the interested parties list. Right. So sources thought is they're looking for prime contractors, not subcontractors. Uh, so if you're not competing for the award of the contract, then you're going to uh, want to find out who won the award. And the agency has to post a notice in uh, SAM.gov of who the awardee is. So that's the fourth time there's a notice. So the first one is sources sought. Second one is pre-solicitation notice. Third one is the actual solicitation. And after award is the uh, award notes. And so you'll be watching for that too if you wanna be a subcontractor because then you know who to contact uh, to be a subcontractor. And, it, and like Kathy said, uh, you made it out Sam, you can list yourself as a potential subcontractor. So before they even put their proposal together, they may contact you for pricing information to help develop their proposal to compete for the award of the contract also. Okay, uh, let me double check here. Did I think? The others I just answered in chat. Okay. All right. So the next page is where are the opportunities found? Uh, this okay. is just another list of places that you can go. Um, Subnet okay. is a big one if you're looking for subcontracting opportunities. SBA Subnet. Yeah. Okay. And, and then the then, first one is first one is research and development we talked about earlier. Yeah. So um, this acquisition central is where different agencies are going to put on a list what they believe they're going to be buying based on budget. Right. Their forecast, and it can be for the next 12 months, or it could be two, three years out too for long lead acquisitions. And then prime contractor list. So uh, if you have anything to do with construction or engineering and um, those prime contractors, uh, the small business deputy for NAFAC Northwest, which actually covers, how many states does NAFAC cover, Terry? Oh my gosh. So about 2015 or 16, NAFAC closed their headquarters in uh, north of Chicago. And as a result, that geographic area of, of states that were under that office were divided up and some went to the East Coast and the rest went to NAFAC Northwest. So NAFAC Northwest goes over to halfway into North Dakota, down probably Nebraska, Colorado, uh, Oregon. I don't think it covers Northern California. So it probably stops on the California, uh, Oregon border, um, all the way up North and including Alaska. So it is a large geographic area. Well, it's not just Washington and it's not just Puget Sound. It's, um, anyway, we have the NAVFAC Northwest prime contractor list. Their small business deputy is great about providing that list. And it does change because when we've talked about those contract vehicles, what happens is whoever wins the MAC, and there could be two, there could be five. Only those MAC holders are going to see the opportunities. So for you to sell to those prime contract holders, they have to know who you are and what you sell. So again, here's that statement, that capability statement that we're you know, gonna be focused on for you comes in because now you have to introduce yourself to their small business officer. And with that, every federal agency has subcontracting goals. 
And the subcontracting goals for this year is 23% of the dollars that the award are to go to small businesses. The SBA 8A program is supposed to get uh, 5% or more of all the dollars awarded by each agency. Hub zone contractors are supposed to get 3%, service disabled veteran owned small, small businesses are supposed to get 3%, and women owned small businesses are supposed to get 5% or more. So those are the goals that the federal agency is trying to achieve. Related to that though, every time that they award a contract to a large business, that large business has to provide a subcontracting plan. And the federal agency puts those same goals into their contract. And so when they go and subcontract, they are to uh, tr try to achieve 23% of their subcontracting dollars to a small business, 5% to women owned, 3% to hub zone, so on and so forth. So if you've got your certification and you've got it identified on your capability statement, and you've got this NAFAC Northwest list of contractors, uh, for every one of those MAC contracts, there's gonna be uh, four to six contractors that won the award. On that list is the name of the company, their phone number, the name of the point of contact, their email address. That's who you wanna be in contact with. They're, they're small business specialists because they are looking for companies that uh, have certifications in any one of the socioeconomic programs because they have goals that they have to strive to meet also. So very important. So on that NAFAC Northwest uh, list of contracts are the MAC contracts, the JOC we talked about earlier, the job order contract, which is currently Port Madison Enterprises. That's a five-year contract. All the MACs are five-year contracts. The uh, base operation support services contract, which is a uh, one, one company is maintaining all the Navy bases in the area on, uh, west of the Puget Sound. There's another one in the North, uh, North Puget Sound, which covers uh, Whidbey Island and Everett in Marysville. So two different uh, boss contractors and they're looking for companies to help them mow the lawns and do janitorial and maintenance for buildings and so on and so forth. Uh, then there are all the architect engineering contracts. So if you're an engineer and do design and whatnot, there's like five architect engineering IDIQ contracts. Um, there's environmental contracts also. If you do environmental cleanup, you can be a subcontractor to environmental uh, companies. And there's a specific just waterfront construction as well. Yeah, so waterfront is one of the max. So there is an 8A MAC, a hub zone MAC, a small MAC, a large MAC, and a waterfront MAC. The waterfront MAC does all the work over, under, in, and next to uh, the navigable waterways. They're large projects like building piers or repairing piers, uh, doing tough stuff underwater. So there are different MACs, different dollar values for different specialties. Anything else on that? Nope. Yeah, so that was uh, the third bullet, prime contractor list of major agencies, matter of fact. Okay, are we done with that page? So we gotta, uh, let's do the next So one. now, what if you wanna do non-federal? Right, state, regional, and local. Uh, Kathy, I'll let you talk about this. You got more expertise than I do. Okay, so, Washington Webs, Washington Electronic Business Solution, um, under the state DES. So you can go on there, register, and then it will send you an email if there's a match for what you tell them that you're looking for, but it is also included in bid match. So your choice is either you know, start signing up for a bazillion websites to send you an email, or sign up for something like bid match and get a single email, your choice. Depends, you know, what you wanna do. Oregon has their version, so does Idaho. Um, Office of Minority Women Business Enterprises. This is for Washington State. And on their website, they have some of 
um, the opportunities that are focused on these socioeconomic goals. So that's a good place to look. Port of Tacoma and Port of Seattle, um, just Port of Seattle, huge, does tons of stuff because Port of Seattle doesn't just own the um, waterfront cargo. It has cruise terminals, it has marinas, and it also owns SeaTac. So they're huge. City of Tacoma as an example. And we actually have a sheet that um, I updated yesterday that if you're interested, that has several other local cities and counties. Just let me know. So, so another big one that's not on here, we've got City of Tacoma, would be the City of Seattle. And we just yeah. had a representative in our meeting yesterday to give us a pitch for that. So there you go. Um, you can always just go, this is where some of the primes are gonna say, hey, we're looking for subs because we're putting together a proposal and they know that they're gonna be um, tasked with having um, subcontractors to meet goals. And you will always see them saying, especially they're looking for woman owned and hub zone. Those are tough depending on what the contract is. So on the Washington State PTAC website, in the blog is where they would post those. Um, on our blog, we would also post them. And if you just go to our blog um, and search for BizOps, it would be there. And this is a bit more about bid match because Terry's already talk to you about how fabulous it is. And so I just went into the system. Um, as a PTAC counselor, we have a page we can go to and just kind of see a myriad of things. So what you would get in your mail might not look exactly like this, but it's going to send you an email daily. If there's a match daily, you get an email daily. And then it's going to, uh, you can change the order of what it looks like by clicking on any of these um, headers. So if you are looking for a specific agency, you could sort by agency. If you are looking for a procurement versus bid, you could do it that way. Um, you could look for title or you could, you know, sort by keyword. So you pick whatever looks interesting to you. So I picked one that was from Virginia and they were looking for someone that's a public relations consultant website design. So this is the synopsis. Then there's the link to go see the actual opportunity. And this, on the federal ones, and the reason I didn't pick a federal one, because it would take more than this slide, because they're huge, because it gives you the whole thing that's in beta SAM. And then there's also the link at the bottom. Something I want to point out here is the urgency to get the solicitation as soon as it was released. So on that previous page, the example is where it says, uh, where Kathy just read, the title is public relations consultant. Continuing on in that line, the issue, the solicitation was issued May 2nd, followed by it's due on May 17th. That's only at, 12 days. At 2 p.m. Yes. If you turn it in at 2.01 p.m., you are non-compliant. You're late. And that's <laughs> gonna be 2 p.m. Virginia time. Yep, it's local time. So Whatever yeah. time zone that solicitation was issued, that's when it's due. So don't, you know, and um, we will review your proposals, <laughs> but um, we might be a little cranky if you give it to us the day before it's due. We actually ask a, a, a week in advance if you have that much time to work with. Um, we're gonna also ask for the link 
to the actual solicitation so that Terry or Mary Jo can actually look at it. And every amendment that was issued against the solicitation also. And the reason why we do a week is we need a couple of days to review it. Then we want to uh, communicate with you our comments. And that gives you a couple of days to make the revisions to your proposal so that you can push the button and send it before the due date. Also, if it's a federal agency, uh, you, this is just my advice as a contracting officer, my experience, there is a federal acquisition regulation clause that I believe it's in the solicitations, if not contracting officers refer to it, that says if a solicitation you know, say they, they received it late because of the firewalls uh, in the computer system or whatnot. You submitted it in this case on May 17th at 1 p.m., but the contracting officer didn't get it till 4 p.m. There is a federal acquisition regulation that says that if you had submitted it the day before the due date, prior to 5 p.m., then the agency is to accept it. So my advice to you is submit your proposals the day before they're due, just because of electronics failures. Okay, enough said on that. And your only option nowadays is electronic. Yeah, especially with the pandemic. Yeah. But can't you prove that through, if, if you sent that out and it's time stamped, to reflect that you were compliant with the due date, couldn't you use that as your proof that you did send it on time? And even if they got it four hours later? That uh, the federal acquisition regulation states that that is what you would have to submit, but it only works if you submitted it the day before. If you submit it on the day that it was due, in this case, it was due at 2 p.m. and you've got a timestamp that shows you submitted at 1 p.m., it may not work. It may or may not, but for sure, if you submitted it the day before, they gotta accept your uh, proposal. Okay. So no but last minute submission, that's, that's, that's the takeaway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so what I was saying before is so important for you to be aware of the solicitations the day of or the day after that they come out because they are such a short period of time when that proposal is due and you need every day, especially if you're not self-performing everything. Now you got to go out and find subcontractors and get their prices and you got to give them time to do that too. So if a solicitation came out two and a half weeks ago, you've only got two and a half weeks left. And so you got to read the solicitation to even see if you're interested in it. And if you are, and you can't do all the work yourself, now you've got to go out and get subcontractors and that window is closing and closing and closing. You got to put a proposal together. You got to have a team to review it, to make sure that you're responsive and submit it. You know, it's a lot of work. Time is money. Yes, it is. Okay, we're all right, we're on this screen here. So what do we got here? These are our little takeaway tips for you on finding opportunities, making, um, creating those relationships with the folks that you want to follow up with you. Um, we've talked a lot about the small business officer, deputy, whatever their title is. Um, the small business folks for Keyport and the shipyard hold a webinar, or a, actually it's a meeting, once a month. And it is on the Washington PTAC calendar. It's typically the fourth Wednesday. Sounds right. At 9 a.m. And um, Dave Walls from Keyport, who is their small business deputy, coordinates it. It is not the same every month. He brings in different commands. This last month, he brought in his counterpart from the East Coast um, 
under warfare center. So um, one time he had all on just training opportunities and brought in those folks. So um, if you think you have something to either offer Keyport or the shipyard, um, the, I would definitely, you know, get my name on that list to attend. The same with that program. Uh, I'm looking at. I'm looking it up right now. I'm going to get on that. It's Wednesday with the deputies. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. So don't uh, don't dismiss it because it's Navy and it's the Naval Sea Warfare um, Command. That's one of eight systems commands within the Navy. Uh, at Keyport, they do everything uh, related to torpedoes, but they recently got uh, the authority from MAFAC to do small minor construction. They buy widgets and services and professional services, not just torpedoes. Yeah. Yeah. So they buy all kinds of stuff too, so don't dismiss it. They also are the host for one of the um, Naval X Tech Bridges, which is going to be focused on innovation for the Navy. So that is housed there. They're um, getting big into unmanned vehicles at Keyport. In this case, mostly underwater, of course, to go check on said torpedoes. But um, there are a lot, it's, it's way more than what it looks like from the outside. I would agree with Terry. It's a little deceiving. And, and all, the, all the systems commands within the Navy are like that. You know, there's NAV Air, NAV War, NAV SUP, NAV, NAV FAC. NAV C, yeah. Yeah, there's eight systems, systems commands just within the Navy. And then I don't know how the Air Force is organized or the Army. Uh, so the Department of Defense is huge. There's yeah. huge potential just with that one out of 15 departments of the federal government. And the reason why we talk so much about the Navy here is that it is our economic driver for this county because Naval Base Kitsap, we have a hospital, we have the shipyard, we have Keyport, we have Bangor and the submarines, we have a fuel depot. So um, we are very Navy centric here. And just down the road, we have the Army and the Air Force down in Tacoma. And we have the Coast Guard right across Puget Sound in Seattle. Well, Coast Guard is also stationed at Bangor. They have a few ships and yeah. they're also, also at Port Angeles. Yeah. So very, but very um, defense centric here. Um, we've talked about this a lot. You will never hear us stop talking about your capability statement, how it has to be fluid, flexible. We're going to tell you what we think your format should look like. And this is based on folks like Terry and Mary Jo and another one of our constructors working as contracting officers, seeing, I don't even know how many you've seen, Terry, and they know what works and what doesn't work. So that's why we're going to kind of force you to say, this is what works. We don't want to see fluff. We don't want to see words like on time, the best, professional. Those are expected. <laughs> Anything else you want to add on that, Terry? Yeah, so we can provide the template that can be used for all federal agencies. Um, and, and why we say capability statement for the federal agency is different than the state, is different than commercial, is because of the content. The two primary areas on a capability statement that differ for each of those is your socioeconomic certifications, for example. The state has their programs. The feds do not accept it. Uh, and if you have your federal certifications, the state doesn't accept them. So that's one reason why you're going to have a capability statement for the feds and a separate one for the state and a separate one for private industry. Another one is on the front side of your capability statement on the bottom right hand corner is where you identify your experience. 
So a capability statement for the federal agencies, you're going to list your federal agency experience, then followed by state, county, and city. Your capability statement for the state, you're going to start out with state experience and, and county and city and, and the feds down below. So the order of uh, importance is different on the different capability statements. On this current screen towards the bottom there, we have uh, identified Alliance Northwest. That is an event that happens once a year, typically the first week of March of each year. And if it weren't for the pandemic, it, this year it would have been held at uh, the same location at the Puyallup Fairgrounds. It's a one day event, it is huge. Every type of government is representative. The feds, the states, the counties, the cities, the ports, uh, prime contractors are there, uh, vendors are there. It is, it is a show that you don't wanna miss. If you wanna sell your wares, you do your market research uh, before you register, you find out what agencies are there, you do your homework, you find out which of those agencies that you want to spend some time with, you can sign up for one-on-one, -on -one, 10, 15 minute conversations with them. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's a great event. I've attended it for the last, it's my third year. So I guess I've maybe gone three times now. So yeah. it's, a, it's a great event. So outreach events, that's what I would call Wednesday with the deputies is an outreach event. Industry days, that is when a command says, hey, we're going to tell you everything we buy, what you need to know, what we want from you. And Keyport actually did theirs um, last year via Zoom. We hosted it for them and they held it over several days. And I'm seeing that happening more and more. Those will be posted as an event on Betasam, soon to be sam.gov. You can just search for industry day or outreach event and see if there's something that you should be taking part in. Um, these probably the industry events from organizations, same thing, just looking, you know, see um, PTAC typically puts those on their calendar. Uh, and again, maybe Gold Coast, typically held in San Diego, will be virtual again this year. So you might look into that. Do you have any other suggestions, Terry? Uh, so to elaborate on outreach, when a contractor, for example, NAFAC awards a IDIQ contract to five contractors, they are, because they've got socioeconomic goals to meet, they are gonna have outreach events too, looking for subcontractors to help them. Uh, so those are posted and those are opportunities for you to attend and uh, submit your capability statement and get vetted by them. So when, if they don't have a current need, but they will in the future, because these are five, 12 month contracts, potentially five years, this contractor is doing work for Naval Facilities Engineering Command, they are gonna need uh, subcontractors. So for example, if you're a company that does concrete, so they may, and they've got a task order to build a building, it's gonna be a concrete foundation. They don't, if they're a company that doesn't do concrete, they're gonna subcontract it out. So they're looking for subcontractors to do concrete. And so you will already have been vetted by the prime contractor as a subcontractor that does concrete and you're, you will be in, your, in their system. And so they will contact you for, to get a quote, to get a price, to do that subcontract for them. Uh, so those are, are, are opportunities too, to become subcontractors and attending those outreach events by those prime uh, contractors that have been awarded federal agency contracts. And they will often contact us to either host or promote for them. So again, check the PTAC calendar and blog. So your next step, I'm going to say, is get your capability statement to us so we can review it and provide some 
well thought out insights. Um, I may use a red pen as a former teacher. Terry's probably nicer than me, but there you have it. Also, if you're ready to start competing for federal agencies, highly recommend getting a, uh, a subscription to BidMatch. Get your application in and you're going to start getting solicitations. Yeah. Any last questions? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Kathy, um, I did send you an email regarding bid match when you get a chance if you get, you know, get back to me on that. Okay. Uh, and then also, uh, I'm on the calendar here and uh, I would assume the fourth uh, Wednesday would be the 26th. Is that correct? With the with, with with the deputy buyers, uh, for May. For May, yeah. Because it doesn't say it doesn't say anything about that. It's just a city of Seattle opportunity. Okay, maybe it's the twenty first. Let me go to the calendar. Twenty nineteen, if it's a Wednesday. Hmm. Getting there, getting there, getting there. It's the 26th. Okay. So on the calendar, on any given day, there could be one, three, five, because this calendar for Washington PTAC is for all eight centers. Okay. So it is on the 26th. Okay, great. Brittany, so. any questions from you? Arrow, Arrow Precision no. USA. Yes, sir. No, not not really. Um, I did reach out to Kathy in regards to my bid match question. Um, so I did sign up for that, and I'm just waiting for the enrollment process. Um, I did not, you know, I reacted and was so excited that I did not realize there was a 30 day trial. So I just put in my boss's credit card and. and <laughs> I was swiped the card and paid for it on the 5th and I have not received enrollment process. Um, yeah. yeah, we'll so follow up with them for you. I appreciate that, Kathy. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you so much for following up with me on that and then um, reaching out to whomever. Yeah, I reached out uh, a couple times, but um, you know how it is. So yeah, no, we know who to talk to. I bet you guys do. Yeah, it's good to have you guys on my side. Um, is there a, a way to get both of your guys' email? Yeah, um, I will do a follow-up um, email to all attendees with the capability template, that list that we referenced, the link to bid match enrollment on the website. And if there's anything else that you have questions about, um, then when I email you, just follow up that way. That's great. Yes. You know how it is. It's like you go to bed at night and then you have three or four questions that come up in your mind. And so, uh, yeah, if I could have a great follow-up email, um, that would be wonderful, but thank you both for putting this on. Uh, it was very informative and I look forward to, um, obviously working with PTAC in the future and all of the webinars and seminars you guys offer. It's, it's really been helpful. So super patient on my end and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, that's why I always keep a pen and notepad right by my bedside table. <laughs> I wake do. up during the night, turn the I light do. on, jot it down, and then you can go back to sleep. I do that. Every, I, I do that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, thank, thank you guys for sticking to it to the bitter end. And um, again, check out that calendar. We hope to see you at least on June 2nd which is our monthly contracting coffee hour where you can ask any question you want. If people don't have questions, we'll just talk more about marketing to the government because it's a topic that never goes away. And you can practice your elevator speech in your introduction. Yes, and, and we have a tough judge that does that. So <laughs> it's <laughs> not me, that. it's not me. Yeah, yeah. No, her name is Mona. <laughs> and she's good. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to end this. Thank you, folks, for attending. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great day. Take care. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.